Welcome to Arts Express. This is Prairie Miller and on the show. Hello, ma'am. I am a census taker with the U.S. Census Bureau. Oh, terrific. Good for you. Bye. Oh, no, wait. Sorry. Hang on. Um, you never returned your 2010 census form, so if I could just ask you a few questions. Uh, first question, how many people live at this residence? Uh, zero. You don't live here? Oh, including me? Three. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to put you down as the primary resident. Terrific. Now, what, how would you describe your race or ethnic origin? Well, to, superior to Asians, but not as intelligent as blacks. Whoops, okay. Let me clarify. Which of the following describes you? Uh, white, Asian, Hispanic, Pacific Islander? Oh, Pacific Islander. Let's try that. Okay, sure. Uh, are there any people living in this residence part-time? Oh, goodness, yes. There's Fluffy, Princess, Tigger, Socks. Oh, and these are people we're talking about and not cats, right? There's really no way of knowing. <laughs> Sometimes when I see their big eyes looking up from my lap, I think, that's definitely a homeless guy in a fur coat. <laughs> Honestly, the government is just trying to ascertain. Ah, ascertain. That used to be my stripper name. <laughs> okay, you know what? We're done. Oh, good. You have a good day, sir. Fluffy, get down from there. Oh, I was chasing a mouth. And that was Betty White dodging Saturday Night Live's census taker, Tina Fey, in that 2010 episode, and which is by way of introduction to celebrate some of the giants of the big and small screen we've lost in the past few weeks, and regarding golden girl Betty White, who left us just before her 100th birthday, and who had just received the 2021 Lifetime Achievement Award from our Women Film Critics Circle. But first... There were complaints about me, and I survived them. The complaints are what kept me going. And that was actress Sharon Gless, best known for that half of Cagney and Lacey, Christine Cagney, the popular show that ran for seven seasons in the 1980s, and that walked an exceedingly fine line between issues facing her and her partner, Tyne Daly, as Mary Beth Lacey, as cops, and as women. And Gless has just published her memoir addressing those issues and much more. Quote, Apparently there were complaints, including surviving Hollywood, alcoholism, and a mystery date with a man who turned out to be Steven Spielberg. She'll be reading from her memoir, but first, some memory lane scenes from Cagney and Lacey, then Sharon Gless reads from her memoir, Apparently there were complaints. We'll find out what those complaints were all about and how Gless feels she may have been a crime solver on Cagney and Lacey, but in real life, maybe not so much. Everybody's happy for once. We didn't have to arrest anybody. Fairy tale ending, right? I'm not going to marry Dory. What? Wife, what did he do to you? Nothing. Well, I'll, I'll make up a reason if it makes you feel better. I am trying to make you feel better. I'm trying to be a friend that understands this. Well, I'm not sure I understand it myself. Why would you do that to yourself? Oh, Mary Beth, would you stop mothering me? I live the way Say I live. something, I'm giving up on you. This person I've become doesn't even feel like me. I tell you my best, I feel like I'm suffocating. I'll be the one if you want me to. It's important that I be able to talk to you. I talk to you. Sounds like you're going to anyway. Anywhere I would have thought of you. Secrets don't work in a partnership. Say something I'm giving up on you. What is wrong with you, huh? I'm listening. the right man. What is the right man? I'm sorry that I couldn't get to you. 
Well, he's out there, Christine. Now you have to believe that. Anywhere I would have followed you. You're not getting it. I'm 38 years old. It is no accident that I never married. Say something, I'm giving up on you. Maybe it's the wrong time. And I... Very bad. It's possible. But you it's possible. It's possible. It's possible. Oh, Mary Beth, I don't predict the future. I hate to see you lonely. I'm saying goodbye. I won't be lonely. When you named your family, you included Christine. I did? What does that mean? Hi. Right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> My stomach began to hurt. I waited for the pain to go away. It didn't. I considered my options. Going to the emergency room would involve me getting up and putting on clothing. That seemed like way too much effort for 1.30 a.m. I decided to ignore the sharp stabbing in my stomach. My attempt only lasted the length of a My Pillow commercial. The pain was undeniably getting much worse. I hid the empty cookie bag and woke up Barney. He drove me to the emergency room. The pain spread rapidly to my back. After multiple tests, the ER doctors were still stumped about the cause. My regular internist was called in. He couldn't figure it out either. I begged him, please, just give me morphine, anything to stop this pain. My internist thought I might need surgery for gallstones. Pain drugs were out of the question until they knew the exact cause. After five hours of MRIs, scopes, and blood tests, they had a diagnosis. Acute pancreatitis. They had figured out the culprit. It was martinis. Martinis? Well, that had to be wrong. I did look forward to a Hendrix martini or two. Sometimes three. Every night. Starting at 5 p.m. The respectable happy hour. They made me feel happy. I thought... Why couldn't the pain have been caused by something that I would never miss, like exercise? Couldn't it have been a bad reaction to the lap pool? Perhaps it's a transdermal overdose of chlorine. The only treatment for pancreatitis was to stay in the hospital, be medicated, and wait it out. I spent the next five days there on really good pain meds. I don't remember a thing about those days. I was released, feeling fine free to go home with my printed-out instructions on how to prevent another attack. At the top of the list was no alcoholic beverages. Right. I'm not great with instructions. I don't have the patience for them. If the remote doesn't make my TV turn on when I press the green button, I call someone to come over and fix it. The next evening, while at a restaurant with a friend, I decided to test the waters and ordered one of those pink fizzy cocktails that comes with a paper parasol. I never go for those sissy drinks, but I thought it seemed safe enough. It wasn't a martini, after all. An hour later, I was doubled over in pain. Pastel-colored fruity libations are not to be trusted. Dr. Gastroenterologist concluded I must have a death wish. He had nothing else to say to me. My bottom lip started quivering, my eyes filled with tears. He barked, You're not going to get all weepy on me now, are you? I thought you were the tough one. He was referring to my portrayal of police detective Christine Cagney in my TV show from the 1980s, Cagney and Lacey. How dare he speak to me that way? I defended myself. They paid me to be tough. You're not paying me. The doctor stood over me. He was physically imposing, a retired general in the army. I wasn't sure if I was angry or developing a bit of a crush. Either way, I followed his orders. I haven't had a drink since May 8, 2015. 
and I miss my Hendrix dry martini, stirred, not shaken. Every single night. Still. I spent the first six weeks of my life in a hospital. I was born premature. On May 28th, my mother went into labor. I was supposed to be an end-of-June baby. After my mother had been in labor for 74 hours, the doctor said, This baby wants to be born today. It was May 31st, 1943. They wheeled my mother into surgery, knocked her out, and performed a C-section. She was sent to recovery, and I was rushed into an incubator in the nursery, weighing less than three pounds. After spending a week in a different ward of the hospital, unable to see or hold me, my mother scored a wheelchair from the hallway and managed to roll through the corridors to the nursery. She was certain she would be told that I had died. But when she made her way over to the incubator, she saw I was alive, though according to her I looked like a pound of butter, like she could hold me in the palm of her hand. The nurse unwrapped the blanket to show her my tiny body, which my mother also described as just perfect. And now, our conversation with Sharon Gliss. Hi, Prairie. Hi, and welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Please explain the title of your memoir, Apparently There Were Complaints. <laughs> um, yes, that's the name of it. Uh, apparently There Were Complaints. Um, I came up, actually, uh, Prairie, with the title before I attempted the book. And it was much, it was very helpful in informing about what, about which I was going to write. Um, how do I start? Well, all through my life there have been complaints about me. And um, um, I survived them. Mm -hmm. And I thought, well, I, I, I don't know if you know the story, how I got the book offer from CBS, Simon mm -hmm. & Schuster, right. And um, I had never considered myself a writer. Um, I was an actress. Mm. But when I was offered the book, I gave it some time. And enough time went by where I thought, all right, I'm not so busy. And I came up with an expression that I've used before in um, reference to me. And it was apparently there weren't, compl apparently there were no, apparently there were no complaints. Mm. The name of my title is apparently there were complaints. And what do you feel is most misunderstood about you and related to the complaints in the title of your book? Oh, my God. Um, well, the complaints were usually about, uh, let's say, attitude, size. Um, this is just from my grandmother. Um, while I was being raised, I it was being raised very, very strictly, um, there were complaints throughout my life. I don't mean they were meant in an, a cruel way, but my goal all my life is to be happy. Mm. And as long as I filled those complaints, it was you know it could be an easy <clears throat> ride. But there were many of them, mm. many, many, many of them. I was being raised in a very certain, strict way. And um, anyway, I went into my teenage years, the complaints got worse. Mm -hmm. um, there were complaints that I went into show business. And there were many, many flatteries, um, and yet an occasional complaint. And the complaints are what kept me going. They're the ones that caused me to learn. Mm -hmm. um, I believed in myself, despite all the complaints throughout my life, when I hit on the fact and I admitted that I wanted to be an actress. There was no stopping me. And I had a woman in charge of me at Universal Studios who didn't allow complaints to be mm. about me. At least ones that were within my earshot. She protected me. Mm. Um, and if I'd heard a lot of complaints within my earshot, it could have broken me down. Yeah. But she just kept me uh, cleaning and so cleaned and soaring and um, made me watch myself on film. She gave me the complaints she saw, but she allowed very few complaints to come at me while I was performing at the studio. Mm -hmm. She okay. knew what she saw. 
And what can you say about going out on a date with Steven Spielberg and having no idea who he was? My answer is beep beep. <laughs> it was during the studio system. The studio, it was, it was an old, that doesn't exist anymore. And um, they two studios, 23 Fox and Universal Studios, set us up based on photos, at least a photo of me. And he was this young wonderkind, you know, that nobody really knew. And he needed a date, or wanted a date for this fancy dinner. And so I was picked, and um, he showed up in a tux with a Roadrunner T-shirt under it, opened up the tuxedo, and there was the Roadrunner. He said, beep, beep. That was his first, his first words to me. Um, there was no chemistry between us, but he was very nice, and we had our evening and fulfilled our obligations and went on. And what's the story behind why you declined the role of Detective Cagney and Cagney and Lacey more than once? Um, what is the story about why I declined? The first, the first time I had already done a cop show, a pilot, and I just didn't want to go around packing a rod. It wasn't an attractive format for me. I didn't stand, of course, with Cagney and Lacey had the potential of becoming. Um, the second time it was offered to me, I replaced Lynn Redgraves in House Calls at Universal, where I was a contract player. And you're not allowed to do series for other studios if you're owned by Universal. The second time, the third time I was asked to play Christine Cagney, the contract system was ending. And I was the last contract player to leave a lot. And with that exit came the freedom to then finally get smart and accept the role of Chris Cagney. Mm. And when Sharon Glass looks in the mirror, what does she see? <laughs> <laughs> Wishing I had a filter, a filter on every single camera to photograph me. Um, what do I see? I see unfinished. I see someone who's not done. Um, I see a very, very fortunate actress who is not done. Mm. And what would you like people to understand about you reading your memoir? Well, I hope it will give them courage that whatever they want, they can have. Um, and the most important thing, don't live your parents' dream. Mm. And many people do, you know? Yeah. And... Um, I'd, I'd go after your own dream. It doesn't matter how old you are. I started late. You want to act? Go act. Go in a community theater. You never know who's there. Yeah. To sign you. Yeah. It happened to me. I told the truth. I told the truth. And it became it became a magical life, really. I mean, you'll see the ups and downs and the, the bumps along the way. and But I never stopped believing. Mm. And I never stopped having somebody in my corner. Okay, thank you, Sharon Glass, for calling into our show. Oh, Perry, thank you. You made it easy. Thank you, Annie. Okay, bye. And There Were Complaints is published by Simon & Schuster. And coming up next on Arts Express, in our continuing celebration of the life and work of those screen legends just lost, is Sidney Portier who passed away on January 6th at the age of 94. And as the first African-American to win a Best Actor Oscar in 1963 for Lilies of the Field, and most prominently presenting dignified portrayals of African-Americans on screen. And Portier was once told by a casting director for his first audition, why don't you stop wasting people's time and go out and become a dishwasher or something? Here's Sidney Portier in that famous slap scene from In the Heat of the Night, in which Portier's Philly detective Virgil Tibbs slaps back a racist Mississippi gentry suspect. A seminal scene from In the Heat of the Night, right in the heat of the Civil Rights Movement back in 1967.
Listen, you know something I don't know? I found a piece of Osmunder in Kovrig's car. A piece of what? On the brake pedal. Osmunder. Fernroot. Fernroot? Oh, is Mr. Endicott here? Yes, sir. He's out in the greenhouse. Would you follow me, please? This here is Virgil. Mr. Tibbs. How do you do, sir? Oh, uh, may I have Henry fetch you something? Uh, some light refreshment? No, thank you. We're right the way we oh, are. Oh, I'll have something cold. Something soft. Anything. Henry, bring in a pitcher of lemonade. I have one, too. Yes, sir. What do you think? It's beautiful. It's breathtaking. Have you a favorite, Mr. Tibbs? Well, I am partial to any of the epiphytics. Why, isn't that remarkable? That of all the orchids in this place, you should prefer the epiphytics. I wonder if you know why. Maybe it would be helpful if you'd tell me. Because, like the Negro, they need care and feeding and cultivating. And that takes time. That's something you can't make some people understand. Why'd you two come here? To ask you about Mr. Colbert. Let me understand this. You two came here to question me? Well, your... your attitudes, Mr. Endicott, your points of view are a matter of record. Some people, well, let us say the people who work for Mr. Colbert might reasonably regard you as the person least likely to mourn his passing. We were just trying to clarify some of the evidence. Was Mr. Colbert ever in this greenhouse, say, last night about midnight? You saw it. I saw it. Well, what are you going to do about it? I don't know. I'll remember that. There was a time when I could have had you shot. You better damn well clear out, and I mean fast. What about that big speech you gave me this morning? I didn't know you were going to slap any white man, least of all Endicott. All right, give me another day. Two days. I'm close. I can pull that fat cat down. I can bring him right off this hill. Man, you're just like the rest of us, ain't you? And next on Arts Express, another legend we've lost, Betty White and her Eve, goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Johnny Carson's Adam on The Tonight Show back in 1979. Adam, where are you? I'll tell you where I've been, Eve. I'm trying to find something interesting to eat. I tell you, I'm sick of apples. Apple strudel, we've had apple pie, applesauce, nothing but apples. What a drag. I notice you don't mind the apple cider once you let it get hard. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me put it this way. I have to drink, Eve. You've had a headache ever since the day the creator said, let there be light. Look, why don't you just go away forever and leave me alone? I'll leave, but first there are a few things we ought to get straight. Like what? Well, we did live together here for a number of years. So? Frankly, I feel I should be compensated for that time. You've got to be kidding. We were never legally married. No, but I performed wifely chores. I cooked. I cleaned. I, I took in the inseam on your fig leaf. You're a, you're a cruel lady, Eve. Adam. Yeah? I just call them as I see them. Is there somebody else? Somebody else? You gotta be kidding. Believe me, there's nobody else. Nobody. What it comes down to is this. I feel I'm entitled to half of everything you have. Look, you never really loved me. If I didn't love you, why would I get upset by your bad habits? What bad habits? Oh, like smoking this plant you grew. <laughs> yes, 
This garden of even gold is dynamite. Mm. Well, you can't just throw me out in the cold with nothing. Ah, look, you spent a lousy 400 years with somebody. They think they own you. I want what's coming to me. And another thing, you don't trust me. Yeah, that's something I want to ask you about, Eve. Was I the first? (laughs) How can you ask such a ridiculous question? It's just the way the snake keeps winking at me. (laughs) Listen, buddy, I want half of our community property. (laughs) And custody of the snake. <clears throat> I only am taking what is rightfully mine. Look, you're never going to get away with this. Adam. Oh, good. He'll know what to do. But she, she wants half of everything I have. Wrong. <laughs> she gets everything. Yeah. Let there be alimony. What? Who is he? The first lawyer. You... <laughs> And in a final tribute on Arts Express this week, of those we've lost, director, actor, writer, producer, film critic, and historian, Peter Bogdanovich, about his most enduring classic, The Last Picture Show, in this last conversation. Bogdanovich passed away on January 6th at the age of 83. And this is part of our last conversation and a final farewell. Why can't I free your doubtful mind And melt your cold, cold heart Tony Bennett's cold, cold heart was on everybody's hit parade. Elizabeth Taylor was getting married. Boys wore duck tails. The police action in the Far East was Korea. And Anarene, Texas, like other small towns, is approaching the end of an era. You boys can get on out of here. I don't want to have no more to do with you. I've been around that trashy behavior all my life. I'm getting tired of putting up with it. You belong to me. You wouldn't believe how this country's changed. I reckon the reason why I always drag you out here is probably I'm just as sentimental as the next fella when it comes to old times. Old times. Anarene, Texas, 1951. Nothing much has changed. And those were scenes from The Last Picture Show, the 70s Hollywood rebel renaissance instant film classic directed and co-written by eminent filmmaker and actor and a guiding force then of the wave of new Hollywood directors Peter Bogdanovich, and a film described as portraying life in a bleak, isolated, atrophied Texas town back in 1951, starring Jeff Bridges and Sybil Shepherd, and that is slowly dying both economically and culturally, personified in the uncritical state of movies and U.S. society back then. Hi, Prairie. How are you? Hi. How are you? I'm all right. What can you say about your enduring classic, The Last Picture Show? and its origins, and something to do with Orson Welles, your lifelong friendship with him, and his impact on your work. Well, that's a long story. (laughs) Um, Well, Orson has been um, extraordinarily important in my life, obviously, for various reasons. Um, His friendship meant a lot to me, and uh, his influence on me was kind of uh, not so much in his filmmaking, but uh, in things he, ad- ad- his advice at times, and just his general uh, attitudes toward art and the movies. I mean, I was talking to him about the last picture show, and um, which, I, which he read and referred to as a dirty picture, <laughs> and. Um, uh, he, he said, it's an actor's movie. I mean, he said, it depends on the performances. Are you going to shoot it in, in black and white? And I said, I'd like to, but I don't know if they'd let me. He said, well, have you asked? And I said, 
no. He said, why don't you ask? So I did, and they said, okay, surprisingly. And uh, so I shot in black and white. That was a very important important uh, piece of advice that Orson gave me uh, to, to, try to try to do it in black and white. And, um, and then, of course, the, the fact that I'm in his film, I mean, uh, that, that his last film is, is a tremendous... It was a tremendous obligation in a way because he asked me to, if anything ever happened to him to please finish the film for him. And uh, he asked me that in, in the 70s and I thought nothing would happen to him. I thought he'd finish the film, but he didn't. I mean, he finished shooting it, but he didn't finish cutting it. And so it became, after he died in 85, it became a, a lifelong mission to get make sure that I could be, make good on that promise. Now, you were a major figure during the 70s Hollywood Renaissance, and central to that moment in time was the last picture show. What can you say about your memories of that period and its impact on you? Well, it was, a, it was, a, it was an interesting moment. I was fortunate to run into Roger Corman sort of by coincidence, really. <laughs> we, were, we were both in the same movie theater seeing a, a film at the same time and he knew somebody that I was with and uh, I, I knew and, 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 and he, I was introduced to him and he asked me to work with him. I had been I, I, I had directed in the theater uh, in New York and, and uh, in New York and uh, had acted in the theater for a number of years but this was my first chance to work on a movie with the Wild Angels and then he thought my contribution was, was was valuable, so he asked. He offered me this opportunity to make my own first film, which which led to Targets, which was my first film, which got some good reactions. Didn't make a lot of money, but it, it, it made, Roger made his money back, which is all I cared about. And then I, that led me to the last picture show, which um, sort of set me up. Um, for life, <laughs> and um, I'm, I'm still at it. Yeah. I, I would say one thing more yeah. about that issue is that I was sort of in the middle of the whole thing because my in, my affection and my interest was in the older filmmakers. I never really got along particularly, not that I didn't get along, I just never particularly cared about my own generation. I, I, uh, not that I wished them ill, I just wasn't particularly interested in them. But I was very interested in John Ford and Howard Hawks and Alfred Hitchcock and all the older directors that were still, luckily for me, alive at that time. Yeah. And so I, I sought them out. So there I was with one foot in the new Hollywood and one foot in the old Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And that's a kind of bridge, I guess, between the two. Hey, buenos días, Pedro. ¿Quieres que te corte el pelo? La frontera de los Estados Unidos. Oh, yeah. Hey, man. Listen, whenever I'm in New York, I'm Tommy Chong. I kind of created Cheech and Chong. And I listen to Arts Express non-stop. Because it's the only show that really tells you what's going on. And we'll go out now with the Arts Express Radio Drama Corner. Stay tuned. Hi, this is Jack Shalom. 
A while ago, we brought you an excerpt from Manuel Tiago's The Third Floor, stories of the Portuguese communist resistance under fascism. Now Eric Gordon has translated into English another book of Tiago's called Border Crossings, a collection of short stories about the everyday lives of those who worked for the party resistance and had to flee from town to town and country to country as they carried out their assignments. Tiago, whose real name was Álvaro Cunhal, based these stories on his longtime experiences in the Portuguese Communist Party. As Eric Gordon writes in his introduction, quote, one theme that pops up in story after story here is that of communication, cooperation, and collaboration. No one makes these journeys alone. I would add that these stories add up to a three-dimensional portrait of ordinary people doing heroic things in extraordinary times. Here's one story from Border Crossings called Women Over the Suaju. Women Over the Suaju. The two women left the country together. Together they had pursued a course of study. Together they returned. They got stuck at a certain point along the way. For reasons unknown, they did not receive the word to depart. So much to do down there, and we're sitting here losing time, Berta lamented, tired of waiting. Losing time, Manuela laughed. What more do you want? There was nothing to complain about in either the hotel nor their comrades. The accommodations, the service, the meals. They had never known anything better. And such courteous treatment, the staff always asking if there weren't something else they'd like. I'm going to get fat here, said Manuela good-naturedly. First thing in the morning, sausage and eggs, cheese and butter. As Berta could see, her clothes no longer fit properly. You know, Berta answered, I miss our cup of coffee with fried fish left over from the night before. During the day, they left the hotel without going too far, observing buildings and people and visiting stores. After dinner, they went out again, and having once stopped at a bakery for cake and tea, they returned for the same every day thereafter. Manuela thought they must look like two single ladies living off their rental income. In the hotel foyer, as they readied themselves for their walk, more than once they noticed another hotel guest sitting still and discreetly in a corner. Poor guy, Berta remarked always by himself and looking so sad. And what if we invited him for a stroll with us? They asked their friends at the hotel. No, there'd be no problem. It was a Brazilian comrade who also was waiting to continue his journey. They extended the invitation, and he accepted with unexpected delight. The three went out for the usual promenade, a short walk, the bakery, cake, and tea. They made light conversation, and the Brazilian was good company. Returning to the hotel, they asked if he'd like to go out with them. The next day, too, and it was set. Sleep well, Berta said, good night. They could imagine almost anything else but not the comrade's response. Sleep? Now? No, now he was going out, because only after midnight were the cabarets full of interesting things. Didn't they want to join him? Right now? Or the next day? I never would have guessed, Berta commented, how reckless the comrade is. Manuela found a certain humor in the situation. Always sitting in the corner like that, his clever disguise totally fooled us. They never had the chance to go out again with him. In the morning, they received word that finally they'd be leaving the next day. They ran into him on the next leg of their journey in another country. They were having lunch in a restaurant when from the next table they heard the musical voice of someone asking, An autre beefsteak, s'il vous plaît. Another steak, please. It was the Brazilian comrade. They spoke at the restaurant exit and took a stroll around the streets. Once again they were together at the same hotel, a private special hostelry like the other one. The comrade was happy to meet them again and now recounted much about himself. 
Like them, he was an underground party militant from the Northeast, a region of misery and rebellion. As they were expecting to be departing quite soon, they decided to meet again the next day. He's a doll, this guy, Manuela gushed. Bertha smiled. He sure is. To their last meeting, he brought a large package. They ate on the esplanade and continued their conversation. He said how much he had enjoyed meeting them, two Portuguese communists and such lovely women. He wanted to leave them a remembrance, and it was in that package something of value that people used in Brazil. He didn't wind up giving it to anyone in the country where they were, and now, given the circumstances of his return trip, he wasn't able to take it with him. So he would leave it with them as a keepsake. Before they returned to the hotel, they shared an emotional farewell, because, for sure, they would never see him again. In their room, they opened the package. To their shock, it was a typical broad-brimmed hat from the Brazilian Northeast, an enormous hat. How gracious a gift! But for them, too impossible to take with them. Before going to bed, Manuela stood in front of the mirror. Did you hear what he said? Two lovely women. <laughs> they all say the same thing, Berta observed. Manuela disagreed. True, Berta was a little plump, but she had delicate features and such enviable skin. As for herself, Manuela, she thought she looked good. The mirror didn't lie. A fresh, girlish face, slender but shapely. In other words, a lovely woman. They traveled by train with false passports on a complicated, exhausting trip with many layovers and changes until they got off a station where a comrade was waiting for them. They recognized each other by the usual method. In this case, the comrade had his cap in his hand and they had a specific newspaper in plain sight. He directed himself toward them, asking, Are you coming from Leon? They answered, No, we came from Madrid. Together they took a bus to a village where the comrade brought them to a cheap tavern, where he introduced them to another Portuguese, the man who was to be their guide crossing the border. The guide reacted rudely, not expecting two women. It seemed to him they would not be up to it. The route planned was over the rocky, steep desert Sawajo Mountain. It was a long and dangerous course, made more difficult by the luggage they were carrying. What a stupid idea, coming burdened like that. They wouldn't make it. We'll make it. Don't worry, Manuela interrupted him. The man shook his head and wouldn't speak, almost as if there was nothing more he could say. We can't stay here, my friend, Bertha added. We're already here, so you have to take us. They all sat there, stymied, not knowing what to do. Then the two men stepped aside for a few minutes to talk by themselves. They came back with their decision. The four of us will go together, said the man who had met them at the train. There's no other way to do it, the other agreed, annoyed and in foul mood. But you two women are going to kill yourselves. They hadn't even started to ascend the mountains before they were tired already. The suitcases, though not heavy, were not meant to be carried on such long hikes. They asked to stop and rest a little. The men acceded, the guide with his back turned toward the others, viewing the mountain range, both close and far. Farther ahead, traipsing across rocky, uneven ground with sharp drops, the two burdened women fell behind from time to time, obliging the men to stop and wait. After an hour, Berta placed her suitcase on the ground and sat on a flat rock, Breathing with difficulty. It'll pass, she said to the others, standing around her. It did pass. But when she stood up, 
The comrade who waited for them at the train station grabbed her suitcase without saying a word and started walking right behind the guide. The trail grew ever more steep and the footwork even trickier. Manuela stepped often to set her suitcase down, not keeping up with the pace. For the third time, letting the men walk ahead, Berta stopped and waited for her. Manuela was almost crawling on the ascent. Give me your suitcase. I'll carry it for a while. Never mind. I've got it. No, Berta said firmly. Give it here. And she practically tore it from Manuela's hands. Up ahead, the guide had also stopped to survey the area. He waited for Berta to catch up, and without a word, just as he had done for Manuela, snatched the suitcase out of her hands, placed it on his shoulder, and started marching again. Another hour, and yet another. The guide stopped again, put Manuela's suitcase down, and waited for the others. They were way behind. And when he looked back, he saw them all seated on the ground, seemingly in conversation. From that group, the comrade from the train station gave a hand signal to the guide to wait. Without rejoining the women, the comrade, too, waited. Her feet all bloody and full of blisters. Manuela begged to rest and regain her energy. The pains were intense. Every step made her want to scream. Finally, she stood up impulsively. Let's go! They all resumed the march. The comrade with Berta's suitcase on his shoulder walked dexterously. Berta dragged behind, supporting her limping friend. The guide waited until they all reached him, looked at Manuela, and spoke to her with an accusatory tone. What did you expect would happen with those shoes? They may be good for the city, but not for a trek like this. Crossing the range with its mountains of bare rock, took many hours. It was a sad, forced march where each one helped the others. Short pauses for rest relieved the hours and hours of climbing. The last two hours were the descent. At the bottom, they confronted a surprising spectacle. On an immense stone platform rose mysterious stone constructions in the shape of grain silos. Were they actual silos? Religious symbols? They stopped, admired, and wondered. This was the designated spot for them to separate. The Portuguese guide would proceed directly to the settlement not far away. The other comrade, consulting his watch, told the two women that just farther on there would be a car to pick them up. The guide stood for another few moments, watching his friends walk away. Suddenly, Manuela, who was limping with Berta's help, turned back in an awkward run with her bleeding feet hopping as if on hot coals. With her hand cordially on the guide's shoulder, she told him, smiling slyly, So, now, my friend, they say this isn't for women. <laughs> she returned to join her comrades with the same clumsy gait, hopping as if on hot coals. A few hundred meters on, a car waited for them by the side of the road. As if coming out to greet them, a warm ray of sun broke through the clouds and fell upon them. Manuela turned to Berta. 
Look at that sun, my friend. I could really have used that hat from the Brazilian comrade. Oh, ho, ho, ho. You've been listening to the short story Women Over the Suaju from the short story collection Border Crossings by Manuel Tiago, translated into English by Eric Gordon. This is Jack Shalom for Arts Express with host Prairie Miller. Si vos crivi muntas crivi, si vos quisi muntas quisi, até dia que vou voltar. Si vos crivi muntas crivi, si vos quisi muntas quisi, até dia que vou voltar. Saudade, saudade. And that's all we have time for today on Arts Express, Expression in the Arts. And if you'd like to express yourself too, you can write to us at theradiogoddess at gmail.com. Until next time, this is Prairie Miller leaving the station.